Hey, uh, I'm Dr. Ryan Manuel. I'm the Director of Policy Research here at Asia Global Institute. Does the microphone work or am I just loud? Okay, I'm loud anyway, so that's okay. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Scott Kennedy, who has a, a distinguished career spanning uh, think tanks, academia, um, and is very influential also in many of the policy debates on US-China. Uh, he, he introduced himself as saying he studied China. He studied for a long time. Um, but he's a very, uh, he's very knowledgeable. Uh, we had an amazing session this morning with our Asia Global Fellows, who are here, um, 12 visitors to the Asia Global Institute, and um, we were talking sort of briefly in between the sessions about how much we all got out of it. So we're really excited to have him here to speak today about China's high-tech drive. Um, your bio says you've been working on this, this topic loosely for about 20 years, Scott, is that right? So, I mean, this is, a great opportunity for us here to sort of get not just the latest words of what is happening in the US and what they're thinking about US-China, but also some really grounded empirical research. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting data and um, also some quite good stories, some of which we've heard snippets of already about planes and various things. Um, Scott was formerly a professor. He began life, or his professional life, he worked in think tanks, he's working at Brookings, I uh, was a professor at Indiana University where he set up the Center for uh, Political Research and Business, if I got that right, uh, before then coming back to CSIS in Washington where he's now currently the Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies. Um, so Scott will talk and then after that we'll take some questions. Uh, there's a lot of people and there's also a lot of people in the overflow. So if I could be really annoying and ask that we keep our questions mainly to just a question and the sort of more longer expositions or statements, maybe we can follow up with email afterwards. Um, great. Thanks, Scott. Over to you. Thanks. Like, I just don't know how to use it. <laughs> so I, I think I've got it on correctly. So if uh, it's, but people will let me know soon if, if I don't. Ryan, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And, and thank you and, and Director Chun and for inviting me to Hong Kong University uh, and for the opportunity this morning to meet with uh, the fellows uh, and for the opportunity today now to share uh, some of the research that we're doing at CSIS on uh, China's high-tech drive. And uh, this is obviously a topic many people care about. Uh, folks in Washington are fo uh, focused like a laser on high-tech and, and China. Uh, it's something I've been looking at for a while, uh, but now that everyone is, is so focused on it, I thought I needed to take another look. Um, in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, industry associations, chambers of commerce, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, the White House, uh, have all, uh, uh, are quite alarmed and worried about what China is doing and its high-tech drive. Um, I think people have, you've either read these reports or heard about them. I think what's interesting in the United States is uh, Made in China 2025 is the first industrial policy of China that every single member of Congress has heard of. Even grandmothers in San Diego, California, or Sioux Falls, South Dakota have heard of Made in China 2025. It, it, the inventor of the term was so proud, probably, uh, that, that Chinese people, that Americans everywhere know about Chinese industrial policy. And um, China has, of course, had industrial policy for a very long time. Uh, but in Xi Jinping's new era, uh, industrial policy has really changed quite dramatically uh, over the last several years. The ambitions for industrial policy are far higher than they've ever been. China is now not just interested in becoming modestly good in a few sectors, but dominating just about every sector from basic research through to commercialization. And they've set targets on having domestic industry capture larger and larger parts of the supply chain and market share. Here's the list of some of the key sectors that people have heard about uh, where the Chinese have set very specific targets uh, to achieve 
uh, domestic market share by 2020 and 2025. I know you all are wonderful photographers, and you can keep taking pictures because I'm in them. It'll make your picture bad. But if you like, I can share the PDF with Ryan afterwards, and he can share it with you. Then you don't have to have my ugly face in the picture with you. <laughs> but if you want to, and your friends will be happy, then by all means. Okay. So first of all, the ambition uh, is, uh, is higher than ever before. All right. Organizationally, China has restructured its government and the party to try and be a more efficient, fine-tuned machine. Now, this is probably going too far to say that the Chinese government and party operate like a fine-tuned, well-oiled machine, maybe compared to Washington these days. <laughs> but uh, China's got, uh, as Ryan can attest better than maybe anybody, uh, a, a highly bureaucratic stovepipe system uh, where bureaucracies don't naturally speak to each other across uh, horizontally and from center to locality you have challenges. And China has been, I think, uh, you all in Hong Kong probably know, but in, in the United States people aren't familiar, that at the, the last meeting of the National People's Congress, they probably announced some of the most wide sweeping reforms of government ever. Now we just created a new sixth branch of our military the Space Force. Uh, China just created a whole new branch of government, right? So we're trying to keep up. Maybe that's why we did the Space Force thing. So, but in any case, uh, uh, China's trying to create a, a more streamlined government and party so that you have greater strategic setting of policy that then is implemented. Funding-wise, China is spending more and more money on high tech. Uh, Officially, 2.1% uh, of GDP last year went to R&D. Uh, that's undercounting by quite a bit because it doesn't count all the money that Chinese companies are spending in all of the thousands of R&D centers they have located outside China or the thousands of uh, R&D centers by multinationals that have offices in China where they're spending on R&D. So it's actually probably significantly higher than this number. Of course. At the, you could turn it around and say half of this is, goes to real estate, uh, which may be true as well. But nevertheless, China is now in OECD levels of spending on R&D at a country at a per capita income still under 10,000 per year. So a lot of a lot of money swashing around this system. Policy tools are enormous. Just about everything uh, under the sun uh, or under heaven is used to try and promote industrial policy. Uh, not just uh, the guidance that comes out of the mouths of Xi Jinping and uh, Ma Kai and Liu He and others. Uh, plenty of, of subsidies, uh, free land, uh, tax policy, export tax rebates, uh, setting of technical standards, competition policy, that is reducing competition against uh, Chinese companies, um, many different things, all uh, used to promote uh, China's move up the value added chain. And of course, China uses its place in the global economy as well to try and succeed uh, and promote its technological vision. It could not do this without being part of the global economy. Uh, China is, about, is perhaps more effective than any other developing country, if you want to call it developing, um, in terms of sending students abroad, uh, investing and acquiring companies elsewhere, uh, at home, uh, getting students who have gone abroad to return, hiring away employees from multinationals, uh, encouraging joint ventures, uh, creating technology transfer requirements, uh, having foreign companies open R&D centers. China likes to say it has no technology transfer requirements. Uh, Give me three seconds, I could find plenty of technology transfer requirements that the Chinese have. Um, it's um, it's uh, quite severe every single day. In addition, China is trying to shape the global rules uh, to promote China's move up the technology chain, uh, including at the WTO, through the Belt and Road. Uh, Chinese government agencies, companies, associations are the most active participants in global standard setting bodies of any country in the world. I've been looking at this for a long time, 
And I remember when I first went to the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, uh, 10 years ago, the Chinese already sent the largest number of companies to the ITU. Uh, Huawei and ZTE showed up with huge delegations, uh, perhaps for vacation because Geneva is so pretty. Uh, but they also go to lots of other places. And really unbelievable setting. If you look at 5G standards, which are now being set for telecom, uh, the Chinese are at the lead head of the pack because of how active they are. So you see that China's, even if you think China's domestic innovation system is bad uh, because of the political system or rote memorization, culture, whatever, Huawei uh, is good, but you don't need everyone. Ch China can depend on Apple, Google, uh, GSK on non-Chinese innovation systems to help their own innovation trajectory. So China's got ambitions, uh, and they are putting a lot of effort uh, behind this uh, goal. But uh, there is a question, an important question, which is just, uh, you've got plans, you've got ambitions, you've got money being spent. What's it getting them? Now, in Washington, D.C., they start and end usually with the reports I showed you before that because China has written it down, because Xi Jinping has said it, it must become reality, right? Um, as much as we'd like to think that is true, uh, it's probably not, and we might want to test that. So uh, my job uh, is the, uh, in this project with my team of colleagues is to actually run around the country in China and, and go everywhere else that we need to go to find out what is the actual results of China's efforts. Commercially, technologically, what are they getting out of spending hundreds of billions of dollars on these efforts? Are they successful? Where are they successful? Uh, where are they failing? What are the implications for these industries? It would seem to me, uh, and I'm not an academic anymore, I work in a think tank, uh, so I don't have to ans answer the academic questions. These, but, the, but the policy question is simple. If China succeeds in all these industries, that should lead the United States and others to have one type of reaction to China. If China's failing, then they ought to have a different policy reaction. And if you're a company, then your business strategy toward China or globally in that sector should also depend on how well or how poorly China is doing. So it seems to me results ought to matter in determining what government policies are and what corporate strategies are. Then there's the academic question, which is, you know, what explains the variation or the similarity in outcomes? And then you can do, a, there's a whole lot of different methodologies you can do for that. Uh, Ours is uh, really is uh, travel. It's good for frequent flyer miles. It's also really good to learn what's going on. Uh, as uh, Ryan has tried to convince me and uh, that reading people's daily is good for you and you can learn a lot, especially if you read it every single day, front to back, and you have a computer help you do it. Uh, but uh, I, I like talking to people, uh, and my team does, and so we spend a ton of time in China and wherever Chinese companies go trying to learn what they're doing and we talk to their industry associations and their regulators. Um, so uh, this is just, uh, so for example in May I got to do uh, 10 cities in 19 days in China. Um, which was uh, fun, <laughs> exhausting, uh, really, really interesting, really, really interesting. So let me see if I can use the rest of the time to give you some insights into what we think the results are of what China's effort is. Uh, of course, this is a project that's still ongoing, and I'm a scholar by heart. So I'm open to revision all the time. Uh, and in, until it's in print, uh, even if it comes out of my mouth, I'm open to change. I'm open to revision. And my goal every time I go on a trip or give a talk is to be surprised, uh, to be challenged. So I want to do that today, too. So just because I'm saying it today doesn't, I'm open to being uh, proven otherwise, OK? That's just how I live, uh, and I enjoy that, which is one reason I like talking to companies, because business executives are, if not anything, different than standard folks. All right. 
So the uh, first thing to say uh, is at the very general level uh, is that China is increasingly innovative. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it uh, we went and looked at a bunch of different innovation indices that are made, that are kept. Uh, there's about a dozen of them that are cross-national, that have about 50 or more countries in them. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the Global Innovation Index, which is uh, a product of three institutions, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, INSEAD, uh, and uh, Cornell University's Business School. Uh, and they've been issuing this index since 2007. It currently has 103 different components in this index, which um, uh, can include both innovation inputs like money, uh, stu students, um, and outputs like market share, uh, and other types of measures of performance uh, to get combined. They also do surveys. It's mostly physical measures, but they have some surveys as well, well where they ask you, you know, who's innovative and who's not. Um, and the results uh, show quite clearly here, which is consistent with some of the other, with most of the others, is that China's catching up. Uh, this is uh, China's rank relative to other countries in the index, which is now 130 countries. Uh, and China's cracking the top 20. This year, in 2018, it'll probably crack the, to the top 20. Um, it's, clo it's closed the gap between itself and advanced industrialized economies that we think of as being innovative. And this is on physical measures mostly. China has separated itself from other developing countries. Uh, we've got India and Brazil. I think I had Russia originally on this, but it's so low, it doesn't deserve to be included anymore. And so, um, you know, um, and so you can't think of China as a primarily rural agricultural economy that's you know just poor and is is only a been you know recipient of foreign aid and and things like that. That's not. There's multiple Chinas, but that's not all of China. China is there's lots of high tech uh, in China. At the same time, um, China's wasting an amazing amount of money, and a lot of money is not used for dramatically high-tech stuff. Um, China's got venture capital. Probably some of you are involved in venture capital or know of people who are. And, um, venture, and there are thousands of now venture capitalists in China uh, with, with funds. And uh, uh, what I've found uh, is that these venture capitalists are not very adventurous. What do I mean by that? Is, uh, there are no angel investors in China. Uh, they are looking for ways to make money quickly. And so they look for th things that are most likely going to generate an income fast. Um, in most of the world where you have well-developed venture capital, the rate of return, the likelihood of return, for venture capital investments that go into high tech is less than venture capital investments that go into more traditional sectors. And that's because traditional sectors have a proven technology, a proven business model. And basically, you're just exploiting that. In, in technology, you've got garage technology. You've got crazy people that have just come up with an idea that's been untested. But in China, that's not where they put their money. They put their money in things that have been proven that they scale up. As one venture capitalist told me, we don't invest in zero to one. We invest in one to 100. We don't look for something that's new. We look for something that's been created, and we scale it up. And we work on execution. Uh, and that's why the rate of return for, for high tech and traditional sectors in China is about the same, because they're basically the same. So I'm missing a slide. But um, that's, not, that's my fault, not, not HKU's. Um, so the, the result of this um, is, is overall uh, what I call, I call China a fat tech dragon, uh, which was where this slide first uh, was published in a report a year, that came out a year ago. That is a lot of innovation, 
but a lot of waste. Um, lots of money going down dark, dark holes, never to be seen again. Uh, money being wasted on, on, spent on commercialization rather than deeply innovative, uh, path-breaking, uh, disruptive technologies. But nevertheless, China is still catching up uh, relative to others. So um, I think that that's largely where China is uh, at, at the macro level. Uh, but that's not what I want to focus mostly on today. What I really want to focus on today is the next question, which I find as interesting, if not more interesting, because the first one, I, I got that just by downloading a bunch of data. And then going and interviewing and comparing that against the interviews. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is the variation in sectors in China. And uh, because we know China is a very big place, lots of different industries, I'm really trying to understand where is China succeeding and where it's not. And you can just do a mental exercise. Uh, and we have this conceptual map that we have to try and think about innovation outcomes. Super simplistic, overly simplistic perhaps. You know, in Washington, their view is that if China is succeeding in a sector, that must be disrupt that must be destructive and bad for the United States. And if China's failing, that must be good for the United States. So in Washington, we sort of got two choices. I've increased it to four. I've doubled the choices. So you might think of sectors where China's doing really well, where it's quite positive and constructive for the rest of the world and for those industries and where Chinese successes might be harmful to the rest of the world. And you can think of the same thing with regard to Chinese failures. Now, why would we ask this question? And Chinese officials and business people ask us, why would you ask that question? You don't ask why if Kenya or Costa Rica has an industrial policy and fails or succeeds, why that may be good or bad for the, the United States. Why are you asking that question about China? And it's a good answer. Because China's big. It's huge. And anything China does is going to have global consequences. So therefore, it makes sense to ask, what is the effect on everybody else? Because when China's real estate sector, just in a single city, turns on the spigots and starts increasing their building, the price of copper globally goes up, or cement. Or when China has a recession, the rest of the world has a slowdown in its economy. And that's doubly true for high tech. Because high tech industries are extremely susceptible to changes in market dynamics uh, because of the way they're designed. So we're asking explicitly, what is not only is China successful within China or in the industry, but what's the effect on everybody else? Um, this is the most surprising. When we tell Chinese officials we're doing this, this is the most surprising thing. Like some of them have never thought of this question. Like what does success for China mean for everyone else? Because in their minds, everything is win-win. It's all schwanging. If, we, if we're doing great, it must be mean that you're doing great too. But that's a hypothesis to test, not a uh, an assumption just to have, right? So this is what we want to do. So the next question that you're going to ask yourself is, how do you, what's your measure of success or failure? What's your measure of constructive? What's your measure of destructive? And I would like to say that it's super scientific. Uh, but to some extent, uh, it has to be art. Uh, po it, political science should be called political art. Because a lot of what we do isn't uh, as, it's, it's, it's not physics. And even physics is art. In sometimes. Uh, but you can have certain types of measures or things you're looking for in terms of innovation, uh, in terms of commercial success, in terms of reputation. And on the effect on others, you can look at what the consequences are for competition in industry, what's it mean for the innovation ecosystem. Profitability should be an important measure. And productivity. One of the things that's supposed to occur when you uh, introduce new technologies is that you should improve productivity. Uh, you should be able to get more output with the same amount of input. So what's the results there? These are all 
what we think potentially useful measures of either of, of the outcome, both for the Chinese and the implications for others. All right, what I'd like to do now uh, is, is tell you a few stories. Uh, Ryan, Ryan said I'd tell you some stories. Let me tell you a couple about um, some industries. And I'd like you to think, where would you put those industries in our template? Or do you think our template's a very bad conceptual idea for how to fit these things into them? Um, and, um, and then let's talk about that, all right? So let me first start with the digital economy and, and e-commerce. Um, we went, we've gone to lots of companies, read about them, talked to people, and uh, I can't tell you how impressed I am with uh, the internet in China and how it has been mobilized to solve so many inefficiencies that exist in, in China's economy. Um, now, you may think piles of bikes high, that, that mobile, that dockless bike sharing is, is terrible because of all those wasted bikes. But it's unbelievably convenient now to get that last mile in Chinese cities because of these bikes. And the way that you pay for these through your apps. Uh, I am, I still use 20th century technology when I pay for things in the United States, these plastic pieces of credit cards that I lose and get bent and torn. And in China, you know, I just swipe my phone. Soon it's going to be something else. Uh, FinTech is really amazing. Um, and most of that, uh, the consequences of that have been very good for the rest of the world because it has put a lot of pressure on Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and others to up their game. Uh, and you've seen constant innovation and increases in spending on innovation and R&D uh, throughout the digital economy ecosystem. It's really tremendous. Uh, and I, I, there are areas of the sector that I find troubling where there's not a lot of competition, like in cloud computing, where China bans foreign companies from directly providing cloud services in China. But for the most part, this is a pretty darn positive story for what China has been able to achieve. Um, without a, uh, the type of regulation that you would expect in a strate strategic sector. All right. Let me tell you a different story uh, about uh, China's effort to build its own commercial aircraft. This is um, a total flop. Uh, China's, uh, in 2008, created a company called the Commercial Aircraft Company of China, COMAC, or Shangfei, uh, based in Shanghai. Uh, it has three major investors in it. The Aviation Corporation of China, AVIC, uh, Baowu Steel, which used to be Baoshan Iron and Steel, uh, and a state investment company based in Shanghai. Uh, they have two products. One is called the ARJ-21. It's a regional aircraft. Compete, competes with Embraer Air and Bombardier planes. There's about 60 to 80 people in these planes. Uh, this plane is a death trap. I would discourage any of you from ever getting on this plane. It is poorly designed. It is poorly maintained. And uh, there are five of these planes in operation now that fly between Chengdu and Shanghai uh, on uh, Sichuan Airlines. And that is because Sichuan Airlines is 50% owned by Comac. The, uh, they are starting a route between Chengdu and Harbin. And so if you want to go see the pandas first and then go to the ice festival, you can do that on their plane. But that is only because the party secretary of Harbin was the original chairman of the board of COMAC. Uh, not a good plane. It will never be certified by anybody outside China. Um, so uh, a humongous failure. China is building another plane called the C919, which is meant to compete with the Boeing 737 and the Airbus's A320. It's a narrow body commercial jet. Uh, this plane has immense problems. 
Uh, it has been had several test flights, but all delayed. The test flights actually didn't test the real plane. They made it. They painted it on the outside, but actually the way it was di designed on the inside really wasn't the plane that they would want to actually put up to be certified, because the plane wasn't ready to be certified. It has huge difficulties. Uh, it may eventually go into service, and Chinese airlines are, are partly state-owned, so they will be forced to take some of these airplanes into their fleets. And if you're lucky enough, you'll be able to fly some of them first in domestic routes in China and then maybe elsewhere in Asia. But when you buy your ticket on the website, look to see what aircraft you'll be flying on. <coughs> now, why is China's commercial aircraft industry such a flop, and why is its learning curve so low? that I'm this pessimistic? Well, that's um, because of three things. First of all, the engine of, this, of aircraft, jet engines, are extremely complicated things to build. And China has just got no good record of ever being successful in engines. Whether an engine is in a car, or in a ship, or in the air, China has never been successful at designing engines. The avionics of planes are also immensely complicated. Uh, and all of the key technology that is in the C919 is provided by Western suppliers. Second problem uh, is the main task of a large aircraft company is to integrate hundreds of thousands of products provided by, by thousands of suppliers. That's what Boeing and Airbus do, and Embraer and Bombardier and Mitsubishi in Japan, and the others. That is a very difficult job for a company like Comac, because Comac is a baby of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. And the PLA is very good at vertical control. It is really bad at horizontal integration. And you would think that in an industry like this, you would use globalized talent to help them do this job. Well, Comac did. They went out and they've hired dozens and dozens of foreigners from Boeing and Airbus and other parts of the industry to work for them and help them build their plane. But not one of these people has the authority to hire or fire anybody else in the company. And they don't get to spend a penny without someone else's OK. And they get invited to some meetings, but not to other meetings. That doesn't sound to me like a recipe for globalization. So the learning curve of China's aircraft industry is extremely low compared to other industries where they have caught up and surpassed uh, in others. So I'm not, if I was Boeing and Airbus, you've got to be worried. China's big. China solved lots of problems uh, that you think they never would be able to solve. Uh, but this one, I think they ought to they could sleep well tonight. As, if, if Donald Trump says that we can sleep well about North Korea, Boeing and Airbus can sleep well about uh, Comac. All right. Let me say something about electric cars, another area China is focused heavily on. Uh, it's a really fun industry. Um, this is a cherry automobile. Uh, this is uh, their autonomous vehicle. It's part of the Apollo project uh, that Baidu or is organizing. Uh, it's also electric. Uh, China is deeply interested in creating electric cars. Uh, they, are, they have now the world's largest market by far in electric cars, uh, mandating them. And anyone who's been to China knows that the air isn't so good. You know China is the world's number one importer of oil from the Middle East, which creates economic dependence issues and, and uh, strategic uh, vulnerabilities for China. Uh, and the technology in an internal combustion engine car primarily comes from everywhere else but China. Uh, the engine technology, the folks that really dominate engine technology are uh, Japan and Germany, not the Chinese. An electric car helps them solve all three of these problems. The pollution problem, the de oil dependence problem, the technology problem because of domination by others. And so the Chinese have 
gone headlong into electric cars uh, in the last decade, particularly since 2015. And if you uh, look on the web or go into stores in China, you will find all different kinds of makers of electric cars. There are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of electric car makers in China. It's hard to keep count of them. There are so many. This is a very, very small percentage of those car companies. Foreign companies have also been turned on I don't, uh, to electric cars. American car companies tried electric cars 20 years ago, then bought them all back, crushed them. Uh, but now we're actually starting to, to bring out electric cars again. You might have seen Mercedes just announced that they're going to have an electric car to compete with Tesla. So China's electric car market is growing very quickly. Uh, 620,000 cars sold last year. The first half of this year, I think it's 380,000. They'll get to 800, 850,000 electric cars this year. All sounds terrific. But it's really important to know that China's drive into electric cars is entirely a product of China's government. This is not a market-oriented transition at all. We went and counted up how much money is being spent in this industry. And what's clear to us is that if you count up all the subsidies that buyers are given, the money put into infrastructure, R&D, vehicle procurement by government agencies, over 300 billion renminbi in the last decade, which is over a third of all money spent in the industry. Now, that's just not one third of profits coming from government spending. That's because there are no profits. There's not an electric car company on the planet, not just in China, that has ever made a profit. Not BYD, not Tesla, not BAIC. Nobody has ever made a profit selling an electric car. The only reason they're making and selling electric cars is because the Chinese government is paying them to do so. Now, you may think that's a great idea because it, gets, it reduces pollution. But it doesn't reduce pollution. It just moves pollution. It moves pollution from coastal cities where people buy and drive electric cars to interior China where they burn coal that gets put into the electricity system that then charges the cars. So it doesn't really fix the air. It, it just shifts where it gets. But it, so if you live in coastal China and you've got political power and influence and everything, it's good for you and you can say it cleans the air. But look at the rest of China. Now, here's a list of joint ventures in China. China has said, now, if you want to make a car in China, you not only have to make an internal combustion in your car, you have to make an electric car. And that over the coming years, the proportion of your fleet that's electric is going to have to go up. So everyone is signing up electric car deals. This is the 25 by our last count. So. What's going to happen? You've got an industry with no profitability. Everyone's making the cars. I don't know. I, I've gone and looked at surveys and talked to, I've talked to so many Chinese friends. Do you have an electric car? Do you have an electric car? Do you want an electric car? None of my Chinese friends have an electric car. No one of them want an electric car. And why? Because most of the electric cars that are produced in China and everywhere are not very good. Their range isn't long enough, the interior is poorly designed, or some other thing. And certainly, electric cars don't have the cool factor that most consumers want. So what we're gonna ha what's going to happen is that we're going to end up with a lot of extra electric cars. So what are we going to have? We're going to have another industry like the solar industry in China, where 
China ramped up production far ahead of what domestic demand and global demand could possibly support, leading to huge overcapacity in solar, just uh, killing off companies around the world throughout the supply chain that make solar. Same thing happens, it's happened in steel, in aluminum, in glass, and lots of other industries. And high tech is not uh, immune from overcapacity problems. So I see huge, huge dilemma for this industry down the road because of how government directed it is, where supply is very likely to outpace demand uh, very soon. All right, so I've told you three stories about e-commerce, about planes, about electric cars. So hopefully you've thought a little bit about where these go in the larger story. This is how I place them. Um, E-commerce looks like a success that's been constructed for the rest of the world. Aircraft looks like a failure, but it's not actually harmed the rest of the world. The rest of the global aircraft industry is doing just fine. Whereas the electric car sector, it's successful in China, but I'm really, really worried that we're going to have an overcapacity problem that is going to hurt the global car industry down the road. Also going to hurt folks further down in the supply chain, like the battery companies. There's going to be a couple battery companies that do really well, uh, like BYD is probably going to do OK, which may be OK for folks in Hong Kong, because you've got a big regional economy, the Great Bay economy. Uh, the other, but the, the, the big company that's going to su be successful is called CATL, Ningda Shirdai, which is in Fujian, in a town called Ningda. It's actually got pretty good technology, but the thing I think is most interesting about Ningda is between 1988 and 1990, the party secretary of the prefecture of Ningda was this guy named Xi Jinping. Coincidence, perhaps. Anyway, and it just listed on the stock market. So good luck to CATL. Um, anyway, so uh, I add semiconductors here because for me, semiconductors is a sector where the Chinese are failing, uh, but it's causing problems for the rest of the world because this is massively distracting the global semiconductor industry from what they ought to be doing. China is going around buying up semiconductor companies left and right and leading these companies to adopt very defensive business practices. Uh, and that's not good for semiconductor R&D, for development of quantum computing and all the different things that are needed for semiconductors to be able to do to power AI, uh, autonomous vehicles and all the other types of applications. So this is uh, at least sort of our thinking about where these industries fit. And I don't know if they align with your thinking or not. Next question is, and I'm almost done, uh, is uh, what explains these outcomes? Again, we're not doing highly detailed academic quality level studies here, but off the top of our head, it seems to me that the role of the market versus the role of the state has a big effect on whether these sectors are successful and what they mean for everybody else. Um, in most of these outcomes, the state has played a huge role in affecting the direction of these industries in China. It, it's in e-commerce, in the digital economy, where the state didn't have clear industrial policy, where you got mostly private Chinese companies, mostly open competition, where you've got people studying abroad, working abroad, part of a global ecosystem, venture capital uh, flowing between countries, where you've had the, the success that's been the most constructive for the rest of the globe. These others have created all different kinds of problems, either for China or for the world or for both. That's a very simple policy outcome message, which is to tell the Chinese government in Beijing you know Donald, Donald Trump tells you to reduce industrial policy. The US has been saying this. You know, It may be coming from the United States, but it actually happens to be true. It does actually happens to be in your self-interest, um, despite the fact that they're saying it. All right, let me uh, some final conclusions. Um, so uh, to sum up, um, China's had very high ambitions, uh, but 
uh, those outcomes don't match those ambitions. There's lots of variation across industries. In addition, it's important not only to analyze the outcomes within China, but the effects of Chinese industrial policy on the rest of the world because of how big China is. And so you've got sectors where there's win-win outcomes, but also win-lose or lose-win or even lose-lose outcomes. Now, to me, in the grand scheme of things, sort of the big policy areas that we ought to be concerned about across the board, whether it's, you know, to some extent, the lesson here is let's focus on those industries uh, where there's bad outcomes and, ad and adopt policies that are appropriate for those. But at the same time, there's some cross-cutting issues uh, like market access or overcapacity, uh, issues of data management and IP. Um, but we ought to target those concerns on the industries where they are causing damage, not just broadly speaking. So as I mentioned, um, this is part of a multi-year study. And uh, we've issued a few reports so far. We've got uh, the one on vehicles and aircraft coming out in the next uh, few weeks to month. Uh, and then we are working diligently on those on an artificial intelligence, semiconductors, and pharmaceuticals this year. And hopefully next year we'll be able to finish some cross-cutting studies that look at global, where China is in global R&D networks, uh, setting of technical standards, uh, and civil military integration. So if Ryan will have me back, I can report. If I haven't upset everybody too much, um, you'll have me, I, can, I can report to you. Or you can go to CSIS's website and see what we eventually found out. Thank you very much. So my question is, while the trade war is escalating, do you think China would probably compromise, adopt like a structural change in their policy, like give less subsidiaries to some industries? Thank you. Um, I certainly would, would like that to be the case. And I have encouraged the Chinese to do that. And I, uh, I just don't have any influence over them, because they have, uh, from everything I can tell, um, the, the likely answer is no. Um, and I, th I think, you know, to some extent, people will say that the reason the Chinese are unwilling to do this is because Donald Trump has put a gun to their head uh, with massive, with these tariffs. And we're going to see more of those in the next few days. I think that's a convenient excuse. Uh, because in 2013, when China had the same industrial policy approach, the US wasn't putting pressure on China, but China didn't reduce subsidies. In 2014, in 2015, in 2016, in 2017, China didn't change its approach. China's got massive industrial policy uh, uh, subsidies because it wants to, not because it's upset at how the US is or is not threatening it. Uh, this is how Xi Jinping views the role of the party. Uh, he believes fervently that the market is, is not to be depended on. Um, and uh, there are too many risks uh, from giving the market too much authority. So I'd be very, very surprised if Xi Jinping was willing to make anything more than token adjustments in, in industrial policy. Um, and I think that frustration is why the Trump, explains why the Trump administration has done what it's done. Now, not everybody in the US agrees with tariffs, but I think generally in the United States, there's a loss of patience with, with China. And even after the Trump administration goes away, which it will sooner or later, depending on your own judgment of things or how much you hope or fear, um, but no US government is going to go back to a previous era of being um, limit, having limitless levels of patience with China. Uh, and I think as long as Xi Jinping is in power, uh, industrial, we'll see industrial policy used in full force by China. Yes. Thank you, Scott. Janet Power from the Asia Business Council. Uh, my question is, how would you evaluate artificial intelligence uh, on your two-by-two two matrix? It is, seems to be an industry where uh, 
China is making a big, very big concerted push um, to push technologies like facial recognition, uh, everything from facial recognition to autonomous vehicles to things like fintech, social credit, machine learning, and where uh, it seems like some of the big tech companies' uh, interests are not entirely aligned with the state. And I'm talking about uh, in terms of standards of transparency, uh, data ownership, and so forth. Sure, that's a great question. Um, I wish I'd have a good answer for you, but we haven't finished the study yet. <laughs> so uh, it's not a cop-out. But I, I guess what I would say is um, there, I, I, I'd come down somewhere in the middle. You've got some folks who say China's the world's leader in AI. Uh, Li Kai-Fu's new book, AI Superpowers, says that you know, China is just running headlong ahead of everybody. There's others who are extremely critical of, of China and say that its system, uh, because it limits data collection and sharing, and it's got hardware problems, like on the sensors and com uh, that'll limit computing power, and uh, that it's going to fall behind. Um, I think it's going to. I think we're going to see variation across different areas. There are some areas where there is less dependence on the hardware use or, or where the hardware uh, rollout is relatively straightforward, like uh, smart cities, safe cities types of ways of data aggregation. Basically one bureaucracy in China controls that uh, and you've got simple enough technology, uh, facial recognition, biometric data you can use for that and make decisions. I was at, looking at Huawei's technology. I was up there uh, a few months ago. Extremely impressive. But there are other areas of AI where I think the Chinese are going to be way behind. And I would put autonomous vehicles in that category. Um, we've all driven on Chinese roads. You know what it's like to be in Chinese traffic. You know how complicated it's going to be. You know how many different bureaucracies have a hand in affecting uh, this sector. You've got uh, the folks that promote the creation of cars and technology. You've got transportation authorities, police. You've got propaganda authorities because you've got information sharing. You've got national security issues because some of that, uh, the smartest AI folks that are in the sector are American and European or Japanese companies. Um, you've just got this humongous complex mix of folks. Uh, and China is actually, uh, and uh, uh, Alphabet's initiative uh, what, by their subsidiary Waymo is leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else in collecting data and has the best algorithms for developing, for rolling out AI, uh, autonomous vehicles. So I think on that you're going to see, I think you're going to see variation and it, it may not fit my nice little two by two, or you'll have to look at different segments in different places. Um, so I think we're going to, you know, so let, let us finish the study. Um, you know, I, I think one of the thing, advantages that China does have is in those industries where you don't have a lot of those cross competing issues, uh, China can scale up really fast. So another part of that, for example, in 5G, China will be able to mobilize many of the component of 5G all at once if it wants to because it has the economies of scale to support all of that new uh, structure. OK, right here? Yes? Oh, OK, yes. OK, you, you, yeah, you, maybe I should let you. Everyone's got glasses. Hi. I'm Jean-Pierre Cabestin from Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, as an American, there is no surprise that you think market forces should prevail. Now, I would like you to push you a bit further that to what extent do you think you can oppose a virtuous industrial policy to a, uh, one which is disruptive? Uh, I mean by that a lot of European countries or Asian countries have promoted industrial policy while at the same time respecting market forces. Now, do you see that debate taking place in China and do you see people pushing for what I would call uh, an industrial policy which would allow China uh, to move forward a market economy, but at the same time keeping 
uh, within the state, I mean, at the state level, government level, uh, uh, a power to lead and, and, and guide the economy in order to modernize it sure. uh, and catch up with other developed countries. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I, I am not um, predisposed or have a religious preference for industrial policy or markets or states or plans. I, I'm a results person. So show me the results, and I know that in certain areas of, of in certain periods of economic development, in catch-up phases and things like that, uh, government intervention can do a lot, uh, and that there is learning that occurs even in times when you make mistakes. So China in uh, China was a, a consumer for for two G cellular technology. It came out with its own standard for three G, which was a piece of junk. Genuinely a total piece of junk, uh, but it learned. So it wasted a few hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, TDS CDMA, but in 4G now, China's competing is China's technology is as good as anyone else's, and in 5G they'll be better. So I'm not always opposed to industrial policy, despite my nationality. Uh, I'm what I'm a, what I'm opposed to is waste uh, and and stupid decisions. Um, and I judge that based on the math. And some people have different math than me. And uh, I was a political scientist. I'm a political scientist, so as you know, Jean-Pierre, we're, we're not the best mathematicians uh, always. So I, I may make mistakes. And we know that the Chinese do math different than others. For the Chinese, they're more interested in market share than efficiency right now. But uh, I'll, let me, um, I'm OK. I, th I think, so I would be, so I, I guess in general, um, you know, it's sort of the black cat, white cat thing for me. And if um, I think in, in China, uh, there is not, as far as I can tell, a full going conversation about how you make industrial policy, what I call responsible industrial policy, with, or disciplined. All right, and you can discipline it, for example, by either on, on the input side or the output side. On the input side, what you do is you make sure everyone can compete for the benefits of state largesse and access to the market to things that get you into the market. So if China wants to provide subsidies for electric cars, well, then it shouldn't do what it's doing right now, which is only giving subsidies to electric cars that have a battery made by a Chinese company. When LG and uh, Samsung and Panasonic and others make better batteries. Um, to me, that's a mistake. So on the input side, I think if you open it up, that's important. And then it's on the output side. If you fail, then you should stop getting the money. Uh, and so there should be discipline on both sides. And typically, uh, I think it's, it's probably easier to design policies on the former than on the latter. Once you start giving money to people, it's really hard to take it away from them. And even in Japan, which is known to have supposedly had the most disciplined of industrial policies, actually it was very difficult for them to cut companies off, right? So if you look at autos, steel, actually they got they kept getting money. It was it was they had to, they had to find other ways to bribe them to do other things. So um, essentially, right? Um, so I and then I guess the more you get to the technology frontier, uh, the the more risks there are in the investment. So if you, um, one of the ways that the United States or others, which still has cer certain kinds of industrial policy, is, is to, uh, you may, is to give incentives to consumers to buy advanced technology, but give them the ability to choose any provider, right? So if you go from subsidies to tax incentives, that may still give companies an idea to compete in those sectors, but they have to perform well because if consumers don't buy their stuff, then they won't do well. So I'd encourage China to switch from subsidies to producers to uh, tax breaks to the consumers if they still want to encourage these high-tech uh, sectors. So I think it's, again, so it's, it's about how you do it then, rather than yes or no. I have a whole bunch of people. You, you, they, I'm going to let I Ryan mean, choose, otherwise I'm going to. Okay, and we'll have to come over here too, yeah, yeah, as well. I, I we'll get outside. Well, uh, 
<laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, Al Reyes from uh, Global Affairs Canada. Um, you mentioned uh, technology transfer requirements. Yes. In IP, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you might elaborate a bit on the trends, because we know these things happen. But do they also vary in terms of sectors, or is there a direction sure. you see things going? Sure. Um, the Chinese uh, government is uh, want to say that uh, they don't uh, have any mandatory technology transfer requirements. And um, that's just not true. Uh, broadly speaking, if you're a foreign company and you have technology, if you want to get into China, then you have to come and pay, pay to play. And typically, in, in, in sector after sector, they will ask you to uh, either form a joint venture or most likely say, well, what type of technology are you going to share with other companies in the supply chain? And that may not be a law, but it's what the party secretary of the province and city and county where you are, how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And they will line 10 companies up against the wall, essentially, and they'll look to see who's going to give them the most technology. Who's going to create the R&D center? Who's going to send my employees from my state-owned provincial investment company to go for training in London for six months? Um, in the electric car sector, there is a mandatory requirement in these joint ventures that the joint venture, first of all, you have to have a joint venture. Uh, and the joint venture must result in the mastery of the three, of three core components of making an electric car. Um, so that's the battery, the engine, uh, and the controller devices. So uh, it is still extremely common. Now, only s about 25% of, of foreign companies that operate in China do so officially through a joint venture. So that's not the dominant way this occurs. Um, is, it, is it on the decline? Well, I think the Chinese government, Li Keqiang last week said it was. And he said that we will never, last week he literally said we will never, this is not our policy, we won't mandate it. Um, I think that's unlikely. Uh, China wants to move ahead technologically in globalization, and this is part of it. Uh, I think that one of the challenges is, is the, the rule, the international rules on this are very ambiguous. So the WTO does not really have very clear rules on mandates to transfer technology uh, in the context of investment. Uh, trade, the WTO agreement on trade-related investment measures isn't very specific on this. And there's no world investment. Uh, and China is able to do this because it's so big. I mean, if um, uh, Norway mandated that every company that invested in Norway hand over technology, well, they wouldn't really get much. People would just not go to Norway, right? But everyone wants to go to China. So uh, China's got structural power to, to make this demand. And so I don't see it changing. You know, and, and quite honestly, if I was China, I would, I'd do it. So. Very interesting, a little scary stuff. Mark Michelson, I chair the Asia CEO Forum, uh, which are regional executives who run regional operations for multinational companies, and they're, they're all pretty concerned about the fat tech dragon and its implications. So a lot of it, what you've been saying is, is particularly interesting. I want to go back to investors. Investors and some of the technology you've been talking about, electronic vehicles, autonomous vehicles, AI, and so on. In the Greater Bay Area, which you, which you referred to, a couple trips there earlier this year, we were told in many cases all these little small companies that are doing the various different area uh, things you were talking about, they have investment from some of the big Chinese tech companies. Yes. From the from the, from the Alibabas and the and the Ten Cents and so on, and sometimes from outside ones as well. Is that driven by the government? Is this part of the policy? Does this affect anything you're talking about? Because I think it's sort of interesting. And again. Who knows if they're going to make it or not make it, but you know they were, they're all impressive, of course. Sure. Um, yeah, BAT, Baidu, uh, Alibaba, Tencent um, are uh, huge investors 
in many of these technologies. Um, you may have heard of a uh, electric car company, Neo. Um, you know that's basically a ten cent child, with with several other investors from Singapore to New York in it. Um, uh, Byton is the same type of company, um, and uh, in many other different areas of autonomous vehicles and other other different industries. Um, you know, I think um, you know officially the data show that you know 80% of funding and spending in high tech is corporate or more in China, uh, which is roughly similar to what it is in the United States and UK. Uh, but we also know that companies read the industrial policy tea leaves. They read the 13th five-year plan made in China 2025. They talk to local officials. They know where the incentives are. And for many companies, their business plan is to get the subsidy. If the car or product ever emerges, that's butter. Right? But that may be a pain because then you have to deal with the product and customers and stuff like that. So uh, I think everyone that operates in China, you know if your sector is a strategic sector and there's industrial policy support or limitations, and you know if it's not, you, you know if your competition is just other good Chinese companies. Right? Um, and everyone adapts. It's, there, there, there's documents and conversations. Everyone's got government affairs people that tell them what, what, what's going on. So, the, the, it, it, it's, it's quite clear. So when, when Alibaba and Tencent or Baidu are, you know, ha, are engaging in their own venture activity, they, they know what the opportunities are. I think, uh, and whether it's from the government or elsewhere, I think from the government's perspective or the party's perspective, there is something that I think that Beijing likes about increasing the concentration of industries hold by, by certain conglomerates. Now, they would probably, all things being equal, prefer that it was a state-owned investment company that was at the top of the food chain. But they know where Jack Ma lives. They know where Pony Ma lives. And so, if you have to have a substitute, it's a better substitute than if it's Tim Cook or Bill Gates or somebody else, uh, or the members. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay, uh, Guo Ting, I'm a research professor here at AGI. I was wondering what's the, uh, what would be the measurements uh, for the success of digital economy in China? Because we, we can already see almost how a, uh, a monopolized market which will potentially harm itself. Uh, it success, in a large part of the success is built on the uh, population base of China and uh, it kind of harms the innovation, the innovation of China as well. I wonder if there's any, when you measure the success or the failure of uh, the kind of innovations in China, what would be the area of divergency that you will consider, for instance, the digital economy, that we can already see uh, the end of it, not just the means to it, uh, the innovation, but almost the end of it as okay. well. Right. Which economy again? D digital economy. Digital economy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can go back to my, my official measures up here that I had. And, um, Sorry, I forgot. There's also, uh, it is driven by the market, but at the same time, if there's state interest in investing in digital economy uh, as well, you know, the control of data, personal data, personal yes. information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think we can find, uh, I mean, you just look at the number of companies that are succeeding, or the, the children or grandchildren of ba Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, JD, and others. Um, and you see certainly lots of, of adaptive innovations um, and uh, solutions to real economy problems that I, I find pretty impressive. Um, and uh, the internet of things. Um, I, I'll give you an example of, of one that I like. Um, I, I, I went to Microsoft's um, incubator facility, and in, it's in Beijing, 
and they've hosted 100 plus companies over the last uh, eight years they've had this. And I said, just bring me out of success. I just want to see one company that's doing well. So they brought me out. I talked to a company called uh, Bai Ke. Or no, I'm sorry, Ke Bai. Excuse me. Let's flip the character. Um, and they make a sensor that you put in the soil up against a plant. It tells you the moisture in the plant and how, it, how the, plant, the plant's health. And then they've connected that to a wireless device that transmits the data to the cloud, hence they cooperate with Microsoft, because uh, it goes into a Azure, Microsoft's cloud, and then it can analyze the data. So you take that device, uh, and if you're a farmer, you probably can look up in the sky, put your finger in the soil, you probably have a pretty good idea. But if you got the measuring device, it helps you. Or the township where that, uh, and you all, everyone's using that technology. Then you really know what the output is going to be for the township or the county for that year. Let's say you're Xi Jinping and you've got every acre or mu of agricultural land in China covered. Then you know, then you have a lot of really interesting information. Let's say you are a, a commodity trader that sits on the beach in Florida with your laptop. Uh, I don't have a laptop that lets me, and I don't have time to sit on the, I have a laptop, I don't have any time to sit on the beach in Florida. But let's say I did, and that you all did, and I, don't, I certainly don't have a bank account large enough to do any type of commodity trading. But if you did and you had access to that data, that would be monumentally great. I mean, think of how much that would help. Because China's agricultural market is so big, it affects world prices. Um, I think there's the potential for that to be beneficial that type of technology in China. It's huge. Then you have to ask yourself, is the Chinese government going to allow everyone to see that data? What are they going to charge to let people see that data? This is not a government which has a reputation of letting everyone see all the data. So that strikes me. Either they're going to raise the price super high uh, so that only folks who are in, you know, the largest, wealthiest institutional investors can see it. Uh, or they're going to keep make it a, a, a state secret. Uh, so there's lots of data that they can create because companies creating that type of technology. If I was that little company, I'd be selling tons of these things. And it's going to go into the cloud, and I'm going to make whether you and I get to see the data is almost irrelevant to them. Um, but so the so there's many potential kinds of benefits of data, especially in IoT, where it's really going to depend on is the government going to be willing to let that data be more widely available. Uh, hi, Scott. We met earlier. Yes. I'm Ira. I'm an Asia Global Fellow. Um, basically, just really sh quick two questions. So the first one was, I was surprised with the, the failure of the e-car in China, considering that e-bikes are everywhere. And even when I was living there in 2015, the e-bus was already in service in Fujian. Uh, so seeing that the e-engine technology, the electric engine yes. technology was already a public utility. Um, why do you think they couldn't make it that successful for the car? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in um, this is the part of having um, metrics that aren't really clear and obvious to everyone at the very beginning. But in, in my view, I, I, call, I think of electric cars as, as Chinese industrial industry success. Uh, they got the world's, you got 70% of the world's electric cars there, huge market, battery companies, and the, the supply chain. But it's, I think, dis damaging to the global auto industry. So that's why I stick it here as a success, a Chinese success, but destructive. Um, now, it's quite possible that what we are is just at a very early stage of the electric car industry. Uh, or alternative fuel industry for cars, and that the, we is that that once we scale up enough, uh, the the per unit price of what it costs to make 
the batteries and the other parts of the car will, go, will fall enough and that the quality of the cars in terms of range, wow factor, where the cup holders are, all of those things, which, which buyers care about. Every, you go to JD Powered and, and all those others and that type of stuff, which, you don't, which is usually not the high tech stuff, it was really important to buyers. Maybe that will turn around the industry and we will not be thinking of electric cars as an alternative type of vehicle, but just one of many types. And that eventually they'll be profitable like other parts of the car, in, of the car industry. Um, but we're just not there yet. So, um, and I'm, I'm just a little bit worried that the Chinese are running ahead of the curve uh, ahead of, the, and so that uh, demand, there, there won't be the demand there uh, that will come along with how many cars are uh, being produced. And that China will then have to take a bunch of that supply and sell it at very, very low prices uh, in Southeast Asia, in India, Africa, Latin America. Uh, and then that will depress the globe, that'll def def depress prices for the global car industry as a whole. So that's my anxiety. Now, I may be, they may have already learned that lesson. Maybe they'll be more disciplined uh, and that they will allow those hundreds of companies to die a quick death and save them. And if they do that, well then this will all be worth it. This learning curve will be very quick. Uh, and then we will see other types of fuels come out, whether that will, or, and other types of batteries, whether that'll be hydrogen, fuel cells or other types of things. And then we, that will, then they'd move up to the next one. So, but they'll need to have the industrial policy be married to discipline of the market, as, as Jean-Pierre said they need, they could do. Okay, if there's no questions. Yes. Oh, excellent. Um, quick, quick, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I'm an MBA student here at Hong Kong U, and uh, one of my class is the Bell, Bell and Road um, Initiative. So one of my question here is because the Chinese government always try to back their chi Chinese company. So assumingly that the Bell and Road Initiative really success. So assuming uh, that uh, Tencent. Alibaba and a lot of high-tech company from, from China would have would maximize their impacts within the region. So one of the concern, uh, what what is your take on the national securities of the, the of the country involved? Because uh, because they would have a lot of data and co collecting, and they would also maximize impact and they change the consumer be consumer behavior at least uh, among the countries in 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 Bell and Road. So I just want to hear your take on that. Oh, that's like, a, yeah, like go. <laughs> you save the easiest questions for last. It's, very, it's an ex excellent question. It's, it's really hard to answer uh, because uh, the Belt and Road initiative is still mostly an advertising campaign. Uh, the amount of actual new projects that are true blue Belt and Road projects are relatively small and located in a few countries. Uh, my colleagues who have done research on that in our reconstructing uh, Asia project at CSIS find that it's a very, very mixed picture without a, a lot of successful examples so far. Um, there's not uh, mostly some fail projects, not like big debt crises that are definitely going to emerge, but some big, pro I mean, maybe Pakistan will be that way or Sri Lanka. Uh, but, um, you know, the, you know, I talked, uh, I, it, used to, it used to be a, a, a phrase that people would apply to Chinese cities called ghost cities, Guicheng. Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm worried that there will be ghost countries where there will be so much investment pushed into these countries that they don't need, that they'll, uh, and not disciplined by market forces, and that will have, have big problems. Now, that's not guaranteed. I think it, 
um, the record of other uh, foreign aid programs, and we have someone from UNDP, so who could talk more about this than, than myself. But as watching this, um, success de depends both on the investor the, and the donor and on the host country. The stronger the domestic institutions of the host, the stronger the civil society, their, their ability to evaluate, to say yes and no when it's appropriate, that has a huge effect on the likelihood of success and constructiveness of these types of programs. So to me, I'm as, most, I'm, I'm as much interested in the places where Chinese investment is going, as well, not just that it's coming from China. But if we're looking at some of the issues that you mentioned, the, uh, that link between national security and economics, again, I think it's, it's, it's really still way too early to tell. I mean, Huawei operates in 160 countries. They got excellent technology. They spend 14, literally 14 billion a year in R&D by this one company, right? Uh, second, I think they're second in the world in terms of absolute value of R&D that they spend. It's, it's an excellent company. Uh, now, uh, you could talk to lots of national security officials and you get lots of different answers about Huawei and uh, what they do. Um, I'm not uh, going to say one way or the other. But I do think what it does is it creates anxieties for other countries that China, where these, where these companies go, and certainly for the United States and, and others. Um, and then the question is, what types of transparency and, uh, can you create to reduce those types of uh, either misunderstandings or understandings about what really is going on? Um, the level of trust between Washington and Beijing right now is super low. So I'm not really confident that we're in a, a period where we have the ability to come up with those kinds of understandings. But we're going to need to, because Huawei is not going to leave. ZTE is not just going to leave those countries. And Nokia is not going to leave China, right? And so if you're going to try and would have like one, one, you know, two different worlds of telecom or whatever, uh, or one belt and road world and one non-belt and road world, the possibility of that just seems, seems to me pretty small in terms of it being successful. So we're going to have to figure this out. Um, unfortunately, we don't get timeouts in international politics where we could just say, let's stop, pause for a moment, not do anything, and just sit down and chat. Uh, so we're going to have to walk and chew gum at the same time on this. Uh, Washington, D.C. is not a place that's good at creative, uh, long-term vision and thinking right now. So we're gonna, uh, be, uh, Beijing may be a little bit better, but hopefully maybe a place like Hong Kong, which has its foot in both camps, can provide some leadership to help these elephants and giants do some big thinking. Well, on that positive-ish, <laughs> very-ish note, uh, it's my pleasure to thank Scott for a really wonderful presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, I may not have convinced you on the wonders of the People's Daily, Scott, but um, hopefully I can convince you all on yes. the wonders of the Asia Global Dialogue 2018. Um, we have more speakers coming. Please stay in touch with our centre. Uh, our next Global Thinkers speaker is tomorrow, a joint presentation with Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, Jose Ramajota. And then next week we have the former Greek Prime Minister coming to talk about debt. Um, but. Scott, it's a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank Paul, you. University of Macau. Oh, hi, Paul. Oh. With every cent I pay for my trip.